Today's second Bible reading comes from Romans chapter 5, reading verses 1 to 11. The core message of the Bible, the Gospel, is presented here. That Christ as both God and man suffers for us sinners to reconcile us to God, even though we were his enemies. We hear. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of the God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through, through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen portion of God's Word that we're going to focus on this morning was the second reading we heard from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. As we begin meditation on that Word, let us pray. Lord, we come here week after week to focus on that message of reconciliation, to focus on the cross. As we look again at your sacrifice this morning, remind us, of how great your love is for us. How it would give up everything so that we could have everything. In your name we pray. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I've got a weighty question for you this morning. What would you die for? I don't expect that to be easily answered. I know once we start thinking about it, we start going through what would we die for, we can come up with some noble causes. We know that there are people who are willing, some of you have very much put yourself in harm's way. You've served in our armed forces. Maybe you've been a police officer, a firefighter. You know that your profession could cost you your life when doing this service for other people. That's a cause. A very closely connected question is, who? Who would you die for? We think of the soldier who would throw himself onto a grenade because he knows if he doesn't, it's going to hurt and kill more people. So I'll sacrifice my life to spare the lives of my brothers in arms. To think about the mother well, the doctors are told, if you go through with this pregnancy, if you give birth to this child, it will probably cost you your life. And the mother says, I'm going to have this child. To very recently, it was a coach, Aaron Feiss, if I remember his name correctly, who used his body to shield bullets coming at students in Parkland, Florida. The Apostle Paul, in this letter to the Romans, makes this statement about what will you die for. He says, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. And we can think of scenarios, we can think of causes, we can think of people that we might possibly dare to die for. Paul gives us four kinds of people to think about this morning. So let's ask the question of those four groups of people, would I die for them? Would I die for the powerless? Powerless, that, that seems noble. 
that seems like something I should give my life to, to think of the people who can't stand up and defend themselves, the people who don't have a voice, to think of the children, to think of the unborn children, to think of the marginalized, the abused, to think of those with handicaps, physical or mental, to think of any of these people, and yeah, I'm going to fight for their causes, and if it comes down to it, just maybe, Maybe I would be so bold as to say I would die so that these people can have rights and freedoms and privileges that I have enjoyed. Maybe. But I'll definitely support them. And I'll definitely fight for them and speak for them. I don't want to die. But maybe for them. Would you die for the sinner? The criminal, the lawbreaker, the one who has knowingly done what is wrong. Especially when you think about criminals, and you think about those in our prison system, you might start to ask some questions. There's a little bit of aversion. You know, lawbreaker? Would I ever die for them? But what kind of a person are they? Are, are, are they there because of some uh, injustice, some, some faulty evidence, some faulty testimonies that that they're actually kind of an anomaly of the system, of the justice system? Um, were they just in the wrong place at the wrong time? They had no evil intent in their heart. Uh, maybe, maybe they did uh, one of those crimes of desperation. Like if he stole a loaf of bread for starving children, I mean, okay. I can maybe take up that cause. I can, I can, I can maybe think in some scenario, in some way, if the circumstances are right, maybe I might possibly dare to die for them. For a criminal. Would you die for the ungodly? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that this person is very blatantly, outspokenly against Christianity, against your faith. You know, you probably know, like I do, some very amicable, friendly, good natured atheists. Maybe I might die for one of them. Or about people of other faiths, maybe of the, of the Eastern faiths, Buddhism, Hinduism, ones who, who seek peace within themselves and peace with others. I got no beef with them. What about the Muslim? How about the Satanist? They don't believe in God. Not the way we do. Would you die for them? Would you die for your enemy? Would you die for the person who hates you? The person who at every turn undermines you? Who, whenever possible, wants to make your life as miserable as they can? The person who goes out of their way and actively seek your demise? At this point, why are we even asking the question? Of course I wouldn't die for them. They don't deserve it. My life is a very precious commodity. I have a short amount of it. It is very fragile. Why would I lay it down for someone who hates me and wants nothing to do with me and wants to see me fail? There's very few people that we might possibly dare to die for in this world. Enter Jesus. As Paul goes on a string of facts, talking about all four of these categories of people, Paul says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. Jesus knows the powerless, the sinner, the ungodly, his own enemies. And he didn't look at this world and sift through them and decide, well, I think I'll die for this person, but this person over here, no, too much of an enemy, too ungodly. This person's okay. That, no, he said, no qualifications, no background checks, no sympathy votes. Every single person in this world, I don't care who they are, they're all powerless, sinful, ungodly enemies to me. But I'm dying for all of them. I'm making no exceptions to this. 
Because God looked at this world and he saw all of us. He knew every single one of us before we even came into being. He knew that when we came into this world, we would not come into this world righteous and innocent and believing in him and, and, and also nice and, and one that would obviously be ones that he would want to die for just by looking at. No, he knew from the outset we came in unbelieving. And as unbelievers, we were hostile to God. We were his enemies. That even as, as a child, as a parent says to the child, hey, don't touch that, and then they look at you and then they touch it. How can you not notice a sinful nature even within small children? They know what is right. They do what is wrong. And you don't even need to teach them that. Because of this, and because God demands perfection if we are to be at peace with Him, He knew this world was lost. Not a single person could rise up and overcome imperfection because we are born with it. We are born with hostility to God. We are born powerless to save ourselves. So God says, I'm not going to sift through the powerless, the sinful, the ungodly, my enemies. I'm going to die for them all. I'm going to lay my life down because... They cannot save themselves. I'm going to love them not because I'm going to get anything in return out of this, not because they're going to choose to love me and I really need someone to love me, but simply because this is what God decided to do, and that's love. Love is an action that you take to serve another person without any thought of having recompense, of having rewards come forward. While we were still sinners, while we were still powerless, while we were the ungodly, while we were enemies of God, He died for us. <clears throat> and that changes everything. Because Christ died for us while we were the powerless, sinful, ungodly enemies of His, the whole landscape has changed. Paul builds on that one after another in this section of Romans. He says that since Christ died for you while you were sinful, while you were an enemy, while you were ungodly, while you were powerless, it means that I have declared you not guilty of your sins. I have seen the charges written against you, every single one of them. I know that they are true, but I have taken that book and I have thrown it out. Instead, I have reconciled you to me. I've canceled out that debt of sins. I don't hold it against you. In fact, I have you stand up with me as one who has peace with me, as one who has a right relationship with me. That because we are justified through the death of Jesus, this means that he's not going to sit there and just, just poke at you, just cause you to suffer, just turn his back on you, no, in fact, the exact opposite. That we can rejoice in our sufferings because our God will never allow sufferings into our life for a, a moot purpose. Instead, He will use them to work them for our good. As Paul says, we glory in our sufferings because we know that our suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. It's not this wishy-washy, I hope it doesn't snow later today, as if it might happen, it might not, I have no control over it, and it's really up in the air. No, hope in God says, I know what is coming. I have certainty in the future. Because God has said to me, I've thrown out your criminal record. I have taken away all of those crimes because I have ceased the hostilities that exist between you and me by removing that dividing barrier of sin. You know that you are going to heaven. You know that you belong to God. You know what he has in store for you. And you know that nothing can take this away from you. That's what we have because we have been justified before God, because we have been declared not guilty, because Christ died for us while we were still sinners. 
So let's ask the question again. Who would you die for? Because today, I'm going to ask two young people if they would die for something. I'm going to ask them this very question. Do you intend to continue steadfast in God's word and his teachings and to endure all things, even death, rather than fall away from him? It's a question we ask of all of the people confirmed within our church. Not because we think our church is so great, not because we, we really want them to remain members, but because God is so important. Because God gives us everything. Because God already showed his love for us by laying his life down while we were still powerless, sinful, ungodly enemies. As you think about that question, maybe reflect on the time when you were confirmed and you're wondering, how would I answer today? Who would I die for? Remember this. Death cannot change what God has done for you. Death cannot change the record that He has fixed. Death will not bring back all the records of your wrongs and throw them in your face. Death cannot take from you the fact that because Christ died for you, he ceased the hostilities. No, in fact, he conquered death, and one day he will destroy death so that it never rears its face again. <coughs> death cannot take from you the hope you have knowing that Christ died for you, knowing that you are forgiven that God has, has put on you his robes of righteousness to know that you are accepted by God, that you are loved by him, that you are part of his family, and that you are going to heaven. Death cannot take that from you. So who would you die for? There certainly be people that we might possibly dare to die for. But today... Reflecting on the cross, reflecting on what he has done for us, we ask God, although I don't want to die, make me bold enough to live for you, and if it has to be, to die for you. Because I know death cannot separate me from you. Death cannot change the decree you've made about me. Death cannot take me from what you have done. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so we stand before him justified, as one's not guilty, to the God who would die for the powerless, the sinful, the ungodly, and to his enemies. May he be praised. May we live for him until the day we live forever with him. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.